Hello, my name is Ann Lawthers and I'm a genealogist at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. For the next 20 minutes, I will be talking about understanding gravestones. Gravestones tell us stories and we should pay attention to those stories. A stone tells us stories about the deceased, his or her level of wealth, social status, his or her beliefs, and of course the age at which he or she died. And some stones will tell us whether or not the deceased belonged to a paternal organization or had military service. This is the roadmap for this presentation. I am going to talk about the differences in grave markers over different periods. So for example, differences between the colonial period, the 19th century, uh, when the Victorian values were predominant, and the 20th century and beyond. At the end of this session, you should be able to walk into a cemetery and be able to tell at a glance how old the cemetery is based on the markers. So let's begin with the colonial markers. And let's first talk about location. Grave markers, of course, are found in cemeteries, although early cemeteries, I'm sorry, early burying grounds weren't called cemeteries. Puritans in New England usually buried their dead in a dedicated ground that was typically located away from the meeting house as the body did not need to rest in sacred ground. For non-Puritans, a typical location for burying the dead was a church graveyard located adjacent to the church building. This was usually consecrated ground and considered sacred. And of course, the final type of resting place for a deceased individual was family property. Many early settlers were buried on their farms. Let's look at early markers. The very earliest grave markers were quite simple. They might have been a simple wooden cross or perhaps a piece of field stone. When the first carved headstones were created, they were made of stone that was local and that was easy to quarry and easy to carve. So slate, limestone, sandstone, even soapstone were typical materials. And the durability of these various materials varied considerably. The stones were placed at the head of the deceased's grave, and the grave was oriented east and west so that at the last judgment, the last day, the deceased could sit up and face the east. Now, the earliest style of grave marker was a death head with wings. Notice the stylized teeth in the image on the right and the triangular nose where flesh and cartilage have rotted away. Puritans were fearful of death and because they believed in predestination, they did not believe in a guarantee of being saved after death. Puritans also did not believe in making any lifelike representation of the divine, so a totally unlifelike skull adorned the grave markers. The marker on the left shows some interesting features. The rounded portion at the top is called the tympanum where the death head is shown. The two knobs on either side of the tympanum are known as the shoulders. The tablet in the middle where the inscription is, is where the written material appeared. And on the side, there were borders. Beginning about 1690, the cherub face begins to appear on grave markers as the Puritan hold on views of death began to weaken somewhat. The cherub's design is a recognizable human face and the wings here represent the soul's ascension to heaven. Now, early epitaphs tended to stress decay or life's brevity. So here on the left, we have an admonition. Remember me as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. Also, the uh, early stones tended to have the facts. Here lies the body of Mr. Humphrey 
Atherton, who died February the 2nd, 1748, in the 77th year of his life. In fact, most of the gravestones probably just had the uh, facts as opposed to a more elaborate epitaph. Moving on to the 18th century. Now, markers during this period became taller and they began to uh, alter their shape somewhat. New shapes appeared. Sometimes the tympanum was e removed altogether and it became a rectangular gravestone. For stones that did retain the tympanum, they might do away with the rounded shoulders and create a squarer form. Inscriptions during that time period began to move away from admonitions about the brevity of life and the certainty of decay to inscriptions that were really addressed to the mourners. Here we have an inscription for Mrs. Mary Monk who died in the 21st year of her age. Quote, the gayest youth, fairest face must lie at rest in this dark place. Clearly, Mr. Monk was mourning his beautiful young wife. While the death's head was uh, still the predominant figure that was carved into a grave marker, the death's head began to be embellished somewhat. Here on the left, we have a death's head with an hourglass, which symbolizes the rapid passage of time with death at the end. And on the right, we see bones, which warn us that we are all mortal and will die. The mid 18th century saw the development of urns on gravestones. Urns were symbolic reminders of the practice of cremation where the body returns to dust, but the soul is everlasting and with God. Toward the end of the century, the willow tree became a prominent addition to the urn. The willow tree with its downward arching branches touching the ground represents eternal weeping and grief. The living left behind will always mourn the deceased who now rests with God. Moving on then, let's go to the 19th century. There were some dramatic changes in grave markers during this period, especially during the reign of Queen Victoria. The concept of a cemetery that is a planned burial ground emerged during the 19th century. Cemetery is from a Greek word that basically means sleeping place. Cemeteries were often situated intentionally away from population centers to allow for planning, surveying, and selling of family plots in advance of need. Now we begin to see the family groupings in cemeteries that we as genealogists value because of this advanced planning feature. At the same time, a movement known as the Rural Cemetery Movement began. Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is shown here on the left, is one of the earliest examples of the planned rural cemetery movement. This kind of cemetery incorporated winding roads with planned landscaping, ponds, fountains, and even rare trees. This was a place for the living as well as the dead. And the markers. During the 19th century, markers continued to evolve. They became taller, more varied, and used different materials. As methods of transporting stone improved, heavy marble became a popular material for a grave marker. By the end of the century, two notable trends occurred. First, the stones became stouter and began to be layered one on top of the other. And second, a number of markers began to imitate Egyptian funeral symbols. The late 1800s had seen archeological expeditions to the Nile River and the uncovering of amazing treasures in the tombs of the ancient pharaohs. So here are some examples of Victorian style markers. On the left, we have massive monuments where stone blocks have been layered and topped by a cross 
And on the right, we see an Egyptian-influenced sphinx sitting atop a grave. Here are some more Victorian markers. Again on the left, it's layered monument, this time topped by a richly carved urn. And on the right, we see an obelisk, again, an Egyptian-influenced symbol, with writing on all four of its sides. Now, 19th century symbols. Gravestones in the 19th century were much less grim and focused more on hope and individualism. They had also become more complex. Here on the left, we see a sleeping child monument symbolizing an infant or child's death. Other symbols you may encounter in this time period could be broken columns indicating a life cut short, clasped hands for fidelity, an anchor for semen, the dove, which symbolized resurrection or innocence or peace. Ivy was used to symbolize fidelity and immortality, and oak leaves symbolized strength, honor, and steadfastness. The marker on the left here displays flowers, probably lilies, which were an image of purity, but also of Easter and the resurrection. And the image on the right shows drapery, symbolizing the shroud covering the coffin and perpetual mourning. Now in our final section, I'll talk briefly about markers, but mainly focus on the symbols. In the 20th century, we see additional Egyptian symbols and a resurgence of classical styles. Granite becomes the predominant stone used for markers. Granite is extremely durable, and the tools and techniques for carving granite had evolved by the 20th century so that it was possible to carve these monuments uh, for your uh, deceased. The markers tended to be stocky and solid. There was also a movement back towards field stone in monuments. The marker on the right shows the symbols of the oak leaves, as I mentioned earlier, which symbolized steadfastness of belief. Christian symbols uh, typically feature a cross. The marker on the left in the center of a, with a cross in the center of a crown represents the departed soul gaining victory over death through Christ the King. And the tombstone on the right, I find particularly interesting because it's a triptych, like an altarpiece, with alpha and omega on the right-hand side of the triptych, the beginning and the end, and the Cairo symbol on the left, which are the first two letters in Greek for the word Christ. And in the middle, it's a Celtic cross with a circle symbolizing eternity. And Jewish symbols. The most frequently used Jewish symbol is probably the Star of David. The marker on the right shows two hands connected at the thumb and symbolizing the blessings of the Kohen. Fraternal orders. We have a number of fraternal orders that can be represented on the tombstone. The one on the left shows the mason, which has the compass and the builder's square. And the marker on the right is for the Benevolent Paternal Order of Elk, with the elk's head in the center. And finally, military headstones. Military stones tend to be simple and understated. They are often built in marble. The marker on the right I find interesting because it has a set of bugles overlapping at the top, which symbolize faithful service to the military during a lifetime. So in summary, 17th century grave markers used locally available stone and typically had a death's head carving at the top. 18th century markers began to use marble and branched out to other symbols such as the urn and the willow tree. 19th century or Victorian markers tended to be elaborate and multi-layered. 20th century markers are often stocky and use granite. And the symbols that appear on the markers tell a story about the deceased's beliefs and his or her community.